morning. Are you there? Evidently, Facebook doesn't want me to go live in the other way. Good morning. Good morning. Tapping on the camera. You awake? Why should you be awake today? Because it's Easter. It's sunrise. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, I know it might seem a little odd that we're doing a sunrise service this morning, especially since uh, we're not able to come and gather, and a lot of people probably have Facebook feeds that are being filled with sunrise services. So why did we choose to do a sunrise service in addition to everything else that's going on? Well, I think we have to do a sunrise service because it just can't be stated enough. He is risen. This is the most earth shattering, ground shaking, life altering reality that we can step into is the fact that Easter is true. He is risen. It is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of an innocent man who was crucified after a brutal torture. A man who was killed not because he deserved it, but because you deserved it and I deserved it. Easter morning is such a vivid and stark reminder that no matter what we look around and see, there's more than meets the eye. There is an a hope and an expectation around the corner that there will be newness and life whenever we look down the road. So, let's dig into the Word a little bit. It's going to look a little bit different to do a sunrise service because I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to play a guitar. I'm definitely not going to play the drums. Um, I'm not going to be like everyone else who can't play an instrument and just grab a ukulele. I'm just going to stick to Scripture. Um, and so I, let me read to you the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's have a, more of a devotional type time based around this. And then if you want your musical uh, part for a sunrise service, you know who's an instrumental or who's a musical person in the church. Give them a call. Give, give them a text. And a few people have already been posting stuff on Facebook last night and this morning. So let's read 1 Corinthians 15. Families, get your Bibles out together. Today is a day that we're supposed to be saturated in Scripture, living in the Word, because this is where our firm foundation is found. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that one, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Two, that he was buried. Three, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. And four, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Mm. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Brothers and sisters, today, quite simply, is a day where we, where we remember that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our place. The resurrection was the sigh of relief, knowing that what Jesus did was true. You see, the life of Jesus Christ, up until the resurrection, people weren't sure, was he a liar coming in with all sorts of craziness, trying to fool people, mislead them, trying to make them follow a false messiah? Was he a lunatic, just out of his mind, didn't even know what he was thinking? Or was he actually Lord, Lord of all? And now, 
those three things, you and I can see clearly, 2,000 years after the fact, that he was Lord. But put yourself in the shoes of someone that good Friday. You might be confused. You thought that Jesus was a good guy. You might have even thought that he was a powerful man. But what happened? He was beaten. He was crucified. He died. And his death is something, and his burial, those are two aspects of the Easter whole experience, the Holy Week, that have to be remembered. You see... Our salvation is not just simply a triumphalist salvation. It's not just a celebration of victory, but it's a celebration of a man who sacrificed himself for us. But not just a man, but the God-man. God himself. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that God took on flesh, that Jesus became one of us, bearing our weakness and our sorrows and our pain, our daily life. The book of Hebrews says that we have a Savior who is a high priest, one who's able to actually sympathize with us to the fullest degree. But you see, all of that is only seen in light of the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. Because if he wasn't perfect, if he was not the spotless lamb, if he was not the one who could stand in our place, he would not have rose from the grave. God would not have accepted it. He would have been just another crucified good person. But, what does Paul say? He says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received, and which you have taken, and upon which you have taken your stand, and this gospel, by this, you are saved. What does it mean to be saved? What is this salvation? The word saved is a term that we throw out, and we, we have this concept that I think is detached from the actual physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation in the terms prior to the cross had uh, more of the idea of a rescue, more of the idea of a physical life salvation. Think about this. If you were to be out on a ship, and that ship were to sink, and you're foot would, be get, would get tangled in the anchor rope, and you're starting to be pulled down. Imagine now someone dives into the water, cuts the cord, but because of the effort by which they went through in order to get down to cut your cord, they have exhausted all their, all their oxygen. They've exhausted all their effort, and they drown instead. But you are able to rise to the top and live. That would be the picture of the rescue and the salvation here. The physical life that is actually gained and saved. Think of the term, you saved me, in the actual physical, literal terms. We so often disconnect salvation and make it just this pure, spiritual, actually Greek pagan idea where our bodies and our souls are completely disconnected. Yet God himself designed us as a harmony of body and soul. And this is so evident in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he was crucified. He was dead and he was buried. His actual literal body placed in the grave. But this morning we celebrate that the tomb is empty. And this empty tomb helps us realize that right now everything that we have that binds us, that terrorizes us, that weakens us, that puts us into the grave, it is not the final say. Now, the main sermon is going to talk about what that future anticipation means. But do you realize that there is a full celebration right now that <laughs> the victory is won? This sunrise service. We celebrate that just as the darkness fades, as the sun rises, so the, <laughs> the reality of death and sin and the powers of darkness holding sway over us and the world have been beaten, have been pushed back, have been obliterated by the resurrection of God, of Jesus Christ, who in the book of Revelation 
is the light of the new Jerusalem. The fact that there will be no need for a sun and then no need for a moon which reflects the glory of the sun and the new heavens and the new earth in that new Jerusalem because Jesus himself shines forth. So, I want to quick just say our faith, though, is not just a weak faith. Our faith is not just some falls on some evidences that are weak and can be pushed aside and it's just us who are relying upon crutches to get around. We have a strong faith. We have a a faith that can't be shaken because our faith is grounded in a historical reality. And what is that reality? That reality is that Jesus did overcome the grave and he overcame it because God himself raised him from the grave language that is used later on in the book of first corinthians and why is that also important because easter reminds us that our efforts aren't what saves us our ability to get out of that mire out of that muck out of that grave aren't what saves us and right now that's a vivid reminder You and I, we can't get out of our despair, we can't get out of our depression, we can't get out of our sinfulness, we can't get out of our habits and our addictions by our own pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps efforts. The way that sin and death is conquered is Jesus Christ. The fact that He is the one who grabs us, pulls us out, saying, no, that is, (laughs) that grave needs to remain empty. Don't get in it. Paul said that outside of the apostles, there was at least 500 people who saw the resurrected body of Jesus. And that was probably at the instance when Jesus ascended back into heaven. And And they were told by the angels, why are you looking up? He's going to come back in like manner. That 500 people, what were they told? They were told that wherever you go, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Now, what are we supposed to teach them? What are we supposed to have this idea of an initiation into a new life? It's the fact that when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, he told us that the old manner of life the life attached to sinful, broken flesh, the life attached to selfishness and everything that could be described as worldly, vain, and prideful, needs to be laid aside. And instead, those who follow Jesus Christ need to walk in a newness of life that exemplifies the resurrected Jesus Christ, his eternal kingdom, the values of the cross, which are suffering and sacrifice and humility and valuing others. And that's what we need to be living out. What is Easter? It is everything. It is everything that matters, and it is everything that we need to celebrate. It is the fact that that cross was a terrible, terrible instrument of brutal torture, something that was used only for slaves and the utmost worst traitors and vile people, not even fit for a citizen of the Roman kingdom. But God himself said, I will lower myself down to that level that I could help liberate you from all that entangles you, ensnares you, binds you, and kills you. That you might instead have the freedom of life, the freedom that I desire for you to have. So, this sunrise service. We're going to celebrate again, 9.30, have a more full sermon about the implications of the resurrection and going more off of the rest of the chapter 15. But you're probably going to eat brunch. When you're eating brunch, meditate on the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. Meditate upon the fact that God is the one who sustains you and provides for you. Talk about what Easter means. Ask yourselves, what are the things that exemplify death? that have a grip on me, that I need to ask Jesus, can you please break this stronghold in my life? And these are the things we need to always be reflecting upon. Give your kids a kiss. Give your spouse a hug. If you don't have your kids or your spouse at home, text someone, call them, tell them that you love them, let them know. 
know that today is a day of celebration for a lot, but for a lot of people also, they have loved ones who are in the hospital, loved ones who are sick, loved ones who are dying. And we pray for them too. So take advantage of the next little amount of time. Let someone know you love them. Smother your little ones with love. And know that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.